some of the really amazing and, and dynamic events of just the past couple of years that has completely changed the landscape in terms of uh, those of us who would prefer not to see orcas doing tricks in captivity and the industry that is supported by them doing tricks in captivity. Uh, it, it's just shifted dramatically just, just very recently. But then, you know, I began to look at it, and to really appreciate that, it's much better to get a whole overview, a long view of kind of the history that has led up to that, to see just how momentous these recent events are. So, uh, that's what we're going to see here. Uh, this is from uh, the Miami Seaquarium, roughly in the mid-70s. Couldn't get an, an exact date on that, but... Please note the circular nature of the, uh, the tank there. It has uh, since then gotten a little flange that goes back 12 feet, and it's about 12 feet deep on the back. Uh, it's been kind of redesigned, but that's how it started up. That's how she lived there the first about 10 years. But before we go further, hello, uh, yeah. Um, I'd like to say a word about a word. Um, and that is park. I have always called them those places where the orcas do tricks in circular pools, a marine park. That's what everybody calls them. That's what's in the media. That's what they call themselves. So that's what I've always called them. But a couple of months ago, a friend brought it to my attention that they're not really parks. A park is an open place where you go to have a picnic, throw a frisbee and maybe see some animals, you know, running around doing their thing. But uh, that's not what this is. It's actually in a circular place. And if you look at the history of it, which was done in this book, The rose Tinted Menagerie, you can see that the historical origins of what we see today at what they call the marine parks was the Roman circus. Circus or circle because it took place in a circle with a stadium with all the spectators watching the spectacle. And what they did was they went to North Africa, rounded up all the big mammals, and put them in the ring and slaughtered them along with um, whatever was the underclass at the time, the Christians or whoever it was that were the gladiators that would uh, kill and be killed. And that was really the origin, and that morphed into the Barnum and Bailey with the dancing geese and the singing donkeys. Um, but it really is all one long historical thread. And you can see over there the dolphin uh, diving through the hoop uh, to show that that's a part of that tradition. So I just want to clear that up, that it's really more of a circus than a park. So now, bringing it up to more contemporary times, it really started this orca captivity business in 1964, when uh, a whale, actually a juvenile male from j was harpooned from Saturna Island and dragged over to Vancouver as a model for a sculpture. Uh, they thought it was a female, it was a male, who lived only three months but in that time, even though mortally wounded, he showed that they're not that vicious. They're not the, the killer whales that are ripping to shreds if they get the chance. Uh, and that, excuse me, I need some water. That completely changed, apparently, from the, the times of, sorry, the times of London, um, changed the whole image of the killer whale almost overnight. But it also caught the notice of an entrepreneur in Seattle, Ted Griffin, who got a hold of a whale that was captured up in Namu, British Columbia. And uh, so he went up and bought it, brought it down to Seattle, and put Namu on display, and made a lot of money, made Namu into a worldwide celebrity, 
uh, movies, uh, cover stories, all kinds of stuff about Nambu. And that completely, for the world, changed the attitude toward killer whales. I mean, give them credit where it's due, that they took that. They should have known. We all should have known before that. But uh, that removed that whole image of them being so vicious and made them into pretty smart and cooperative and easy to train. But that also made them hot commodities at the box office. And that started the roundups. And within a year, the first Shamu, who was captured as a companion for Nabu, and then shipped down to San Diego because she didn't get along with Nabu, um, was uh, the first killer whale on display at the new start of the aquarium called SeaWorld in San Diego. So look at the size of that circular tank. Uh, that's where she spent, I don't know how many years, but she only lived seven years. And then uh, there were more shamus to come after that, as you know. So now I want to introduce you to a pivotal figure, Dr. Ken Norris, who is generally and very fondly known as the father of cetology. And really, directly or indirectly, he was the, the mentor and the father figure for every cetologist out there. We all owe a lot to Ken Norris. He discovered echolocation in dolphins, or proved it. Um, and he just did a whole lot of great stuff. He started the first biennial conference on cetology. He, he uh, started the society and was the first president of the Society of Marine Mammalogy. And he also started several marine parks and was one of SeaWorld's original owners. So what that did is it gave SeaWorld complete invincibility from any criticism. Certainly from any, any scientific person, you could not criticize SeaWorld in, in captivity or you were criticizing Father Ken Norris. You couldn't do that. He was really, he was a great guy in a lot of ways. And that gave, also it gave SeaWorld this aura of, of complete authority. There was just no scientist anywhere who could contradict the SeaWorld scientists. So they had it. They had a lot on credibility. And uh, for a long time, they, they, they were cetology. It was completely intermixed with SeaWorld, certainly in the beginning. So that is sort of the, the image that SeaWorld has continued with to this day, even though they've long outlived the uh, reality of that. So within a couple of years, well, by 1990, uh, there were orcas in captivity in all of these places. The ones in bold are the ones where there are still orcas in captivity. Uh, all over the place, private home in Japan, for instance. I mean, just all over. They were just such hot commodities. People made a lot of money all over the world. And to date, as of now, 156 have died in the captivity. So that sort of gives you a sense of the, the breadth and scope of the industry. So go forward to 1976, right here, where the captures finally ended. And I'll be telling you about a book that is in, uh, in production right now to uh, describe that whole 10-year period of captures in these waters. Uh, I'll tell you a little more about that later. But it was mainly by the efforts of Secretary of State Ralph Monroe to end the captures. He wasn't Secretary of State then. He was an assistant to the, to the, the governor, Governor Evans. But he managed to basically, with a whole lot of help from a lot of people, a lot of journalists and a lot of other people, to stop the captures. Uh, this is Ralph at one of our uh, annual August 8th Orca Capture commemorations right here in Penn Cove, uh, where it took place. And that's sort of a typical quote from 
Ralph, people are sick and tired of these Southern California amusement parks taking our wildlife down here to die. And on and on. Uh, that's, he was a very blunt speaker. <laughs> Still is. So also in 1976, uh, Ken Balcom got a contract to count the whales. Uh, it was due to the captures uh, because uh, nobody knew how many there were and if that population was being depleted. So it was very important to get a count. But Ken didn't have really any interest in the whole captivity issue. His interest was, like it says there, to do a scientific study, purely scientific and to get information on the, the natural history, social behavior, and population dynamics of these animals. And he was just a cut and dry data gathering field researcher. He would report his studies, but he wasn't doing it for any cause except science, good, pure science. Uh, and in 1980, a couple years later, I joined with Orca Survey as a complete neophyte, I didn't know whales from hippopotami, but uh, I learned fast and uh, got completely engrossed in the topic. Uh, but I was, along with Ken, just a, you know, a researcher. I was just uh, fascinated by the science of studying these, these whales. So uh, that was our complete focus. Even though there were whales from that population in captivity, and by 1987, there was only one Lolita uh, in captivity, but we really didn't pay that any mind at that time. We were involved in just doing the field research. So this is uh, the first of a series of slides uh, just to let you know about the changing ownership of SeaWorld. Ken Norris got out in uh, 1976 when Harcourt Grace Jovanovich bought parks um, and expanded them and did all kinds of things and then it became a marketing machine at that point. Uh, still taking full advantage of that uh, immunity from any criticism and that aura of ultimate authority uh, but marketing and just shaping our image of not only the experience at SeaWorld but of the whales themselves from sort of cuddly teddy whales to, you know, well, first they were vicious whales, but our expert trainers could train them to do anything. Uh, you know, they sort of they made up the image, uh-oh, oh, that's okay, that's not a power failure, that's Sandy. <laughs> Good idea, Sandy. Um, is that better? Yes. Good. So anyway, it changed hands in 1976. And then in 1989, it changed hands again. And this time it was bought by Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch here, um, along with a couple of other amusement parks, theme parks. Um, and uh, it became even more of a marketing machine. We all know how good Budweiser is at selling their beer. Well, they applied all of those methods and those, uh, who knows how many, you know, office buildings full of PR professionals to marketing SeaWorld. Uh, so they really built it up. And you know, between 1976 and 89, even though captures ended here, they started up within a month off of Iceland, and another 77 were captured between 76 and 89, mostly in Iceland, but also Japan, Argentina, a few other places. So the industry went on. There was no let up. Even though there were protesters, there were a few people here and there who put up a sign, wrote a letter, tried to do something about it, but were absolutely no match for the publicity machine of first Harcourt Brace and then Budweiser. Uh, you just, you can't match those people in terms of influencing the public, the whole public consciousness and opinion. And then there was this incident right across the way here in Victoria where three whales, one of them being Tilikum, killed a trainer. And it wasn't just playing around. Uh, they dragged her in, dragged her down, and wouldn't let her out. And 
and mangled her pretty bad. So that was quite a shock. But it was such an anomaly, and it was in Canada, so it didn't have to be recorded. <laughs> so not very many people heard about it outside the industry, and the ones inside didn't really want to do anything about it. So uh, within a year, Tilikum got shipped down to Orlando, SeaWorld, and we will hear more about that, of course. And then, fast forward, years go by, and the, the industry just keeps growing and growing and growing, even though they're killing whales rapidly. And they're all dying in their youth, because they were all captured young, of course. Uh, so, June 1993, Free Willy, the movie, is released, and that gave great hope to a lot of people. Here's a movie about releasing an orca that's being abused in captivity. What could be better than that? Um, a little side note on that, this was not the intention at all. The producers wanted to make a movie about whaling, but they couldn't find a really engaging plot about a Mickey whale. <laughs> so the, the only story they could find was about an orca. And so they made that movie, and then they had the 800 number at the end where you're supposed to call in to register your complaint about whaling. But almost all the calls, and there were hundreds of thousands of them, were about, what are we going to do about Willie? How are we going to get him out of there? Uh, so that generated a huge response to try to do something to get the actual movie star whale out of that little tiny tank. So on September 1st, uh, Ken actually went to Mexico City and got the job, much to his amazement, to release Keiko uh, in a, you know, a phased, very carefully done uh, release back to his native waters off Iceland. Um, and the same day, the industry intervened and said, oh, no, 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 no. Don't listen to that fuzzy-faced biologist. Uh, we'll take care of that whale. And they used various methods to uh, negate the deal, which was recorded. Uh, it was a promise. They were not going to negotiate with anybody for six months while Ken devised his plan. But he had already been working on it because he had been requested in June or maybe May of that year to do something to help Keiko. So he already had a pretty good plan in mind. And then there was a Life Magazine story which generated global response, a huge amount, and the story was all about Ken's plan. Even though the industry had already intervened and in Mexico City, the park didn't want to do anything with Ken at that point. But Craig McCullough had a two and a half million dollar check written out to Ken to do something for Keiko. Uh, but it wasn't until June of 1994 that Ken officially and totally and completely lost that opportunity and, of course, uh, the check and everything else to do with it. Ken wanted to start a field study of Icelandic orchids. With the unlimited funds from Macaw, he could have done that. Uh, and that way Keiko might have reunited with his actual family if that had been allowed, but that was stopped. So Ken lost the job. Um, but about that time, and because of the movie, Naomi Rose was hired at the Humane Society of the U.S. Uh, to start their campaign against captivity. So she did everything she could, like compiling these statistics. 18% of the wild population around here died between 73 and 92 whereas 48% of the captive population died. That should end the story. The experiment fails. It doesn't work. You cannot keep them captive. They just won't live. And of course, of those 48%, they were all young. Um, so, and this is something, the internet's a wonderful thing, uh, and this is a bar chart that shows that most of them, by far, died before the age of 15. Uh, so, you know, that should tell you a lot, but it's still no match for the marketing power of the industry. Uh, okay, one question. We're going to have most of them for last, but if there's something right now, yes. How long does a whale live? 
Uh, how long does a whale live is the question. Well, the average females can live uh, average about 50 and 90 or 100 is entirely possible. Males, uh, a little over half that. Average about 30 and, well, you know, J1 Ruffles was photographically documented to be 60 years old when he died last year, so uh, a lot longer than 50. Uh, 1994, this was a, a gadfly meeting. Gadfly was kind of what it sounds like. So a bunch of ragtag activists from all over the place. We were funded by the Animal Welfare Institute to have meetings and do these protests. Here we were at uh, Marine World Africa, Vallejo, California. Uh, that's us standing up in the front row, holding hands, in silent witness to the tragedy of captivity. And Yaka there is uh, looking at us very closely. Um, so, you know, that's kind of ineffective. All we can do, we just, we don't have uh, the, the, the money behind us. We don't have the, the ability to really make a whole lot of waves. But, you know, I mean, that plants some seeds, it turns some heads. So that was really all we could do. There were meetings in Ontario, Canada, and uh, several other places where there are uh, circuses. And then in 1994, uh, the Seattle Times Magazine ran a cover story about Ken's turning his attention from Keiko to Lolita. Let's get Lolita out of there. So this is a big long feature length story. It went very well and it sort of put Ken on the map as working now for Lolita. He, he realized in that until almost a year, really, that he was working on the Keiko project before it got pulled out from under him. He learned a lot, and he applied the science, and it was still based on science, not only the, the sort of the solution to it, but what he, you know, to being able to do it, he, he by looking at all the precedents, he could see that it could be done. You could release a long-term captive orca in a gradual program back into the ocean, but also the benefits to science of studying what happens. That's what he wanted to see. He wanted to unlock the mysteries of the oceans to see what's in their minds, to see the ability to recognize and remember and rejoin if possible, to see if it's possible or not. I mean, it would be an experiment, admittedly, and it would reveal a lot to just see how it could be done. That's how he was approaching it. And so in March of 95, Ken, Ralph Monroe, and Governor Mike Lowry launched the Lolita campaign. They had a press conference with all the networks and the radio and print media and the charts and graphs, and they made a big to-do of it and announced we are starting the Lolita campaign. And the next day, they all went back to their jobs, and there was no Lolita campaign, actually. So I raised my hand. Well, I'll do a Lolita campaign, that sounds like fun. So I started a nonprofit organization called the Tokite Foundation, which was the original name given to Lolita when she was purchased uh, from Penn Cove, and started you know, a very small nonprofit organization just to try to do this campaign that had been started. I thought that seems like a worthy uh, cause to devote myself to, and we did want to start with a communications experiment from Miami to San Juan Island uh, using Craig McCaw's satellites. Uh, he was a cell phone magnate, by the way, so he owned satellites and would probably love to see them used this way. It never happened, of course. They refused in Miami to allow it to happen. They said it would not be interesting. I think it would. Um, so that's, that was the origins of the Lolita campaign right there. So a lot of these are just sort of events that happened that, you know, it might be hard to see the direct uh, threads and connections, but they're all kind of feeding into the public consciousness and changing minds a little at a time. And this was actually a very big event, 1995, two uh, NOAA scientists went through all the statistics, which are really pretty hard to do. Uh, 
to compare captivity with the wild in terms of mortalities and everything else. But they came up with the conclusion that survival of the wild population was significantly higher than the captive population, which means mortalities were significantly higher in captivity. Uh, so that should have ended the story right there. That pretty well proved it. But of course, it can be ignored by the industry, and that's what they did. And then uh, in November of 95, uh, Eric Hoyt, Naomi Rose, and I did a little prank at the biennial conference hosted by Orlando SeaWorld. Um, having fun with PageMaker, I put together this full uh, scientific paper <laughs> called uh, Observations of Disparity Between the Educational Material Related to Killer Whales Disseminated by the Public Display Institutions and the Actual Scientific Literature. <laughs> <laughs> and, and cited all kinds of sources and references. And, so, uh, and we printed up a couple of hundred of those and went around the biennial conference in elevators and hallways and just passed them out to everybody we could, which was a lot of fun. Um, you know, did anybody come up and say, I really changed my mind from that? No. But you never know, you know, who might have read it, taken it home, and, you know, had a little bit of a change of heart or opened up their minds a little bit from it. And then, uh, in uh, 1996, Keiko went to Oregon. Uh, Craig McCaw, who was still doing the project, just with uh, Earth Island Institute, Warner Brothers, and the Humane Society, uh, but hiring staff, because that's the only place you could find them, was from the industry, and so he was persuaded that Keiko needed a $12 million tank uh, as a halfway house, so he built one in Oregon. Um, and that year also, Como TV came out with an hour-long documentary called Lolita, Spirit in the Water, which was beautiful, really well done. Kathy Gertson narrated it, and uh, they came out here for a week. They went to Miami, actually, with the subterfuge that they were doing a sort of a glamour piece on what it's like to be a trainer, and got some great interviews about their bonding with Lolita, about how Lolita was their best friend and could, could feel their emotions and just beautiful stuff. Um, so that's, that's probably still available somewhere. That's a VHS copy. I don't know if it's on DVD. Um, and then a little later, Dateline NBC took a tape that Ken had made, a digital tape of a super pod in the middle of the night with no other noises at all, just at that point, almost a hundred JK and L whales in Harrow Strait having a great time. Just uh, chatter, chatter, chatter. And uh, Dateline NBC played it for Lolita, and that was her response. So then in September 97, I went to Miami, uh, sponsored at first by the Progressive Animal Welfare Society, and I ended up staying two years to try to just generate more public opinion that Lolita should go home, that she shouldn't be there. I brought all the science and presented it everywhere and did demonstrations and more demonstrations and, you know, was able to get some pretty reasonable crowds out on the sidewalk in front of this aquarium and got some just beautiful little letters from adorable little girls about Lolita, you know, showing that someone's hearing this anyway. And that provided, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of incentive to keep going. And did more demonstrations, and Ralph and Karen Monroe came to Miami to join us in our demonstrations, and we got, uh, you know, good print media uh, in the Miami Herald, and Miss Berta came down to Miami to join the protests, and uh, Elton John joined the campaign. <laughs> for about a week until somebody got to him and said, no, that's the entertainment industry you're going up against. So he backed out. Um, had more demonstrations and even got in the Spanish language, El Nuevo Herald. We got in some good press, the business section of the Miami Herald. 
New Times Magazine, Living La Vida Morta. And even the National Enquirer. We were at the supermarket. A full page spread with a coupon to send to a senator in Florida. Things were looking up, it seemed, for a little while. But, you know, what was the real effectiveness? Did it change the minds of the owners? You know, did it bring down revenues at the gate? I don't think so. We just really were no match still for the, the marketing power of the industry with their glow of credibility and scientific authority. So, you know, you never know. I mean, seeds were planted and things did happen that maybe appeared later on, years later. But uh, at the time, it just, you know, people would say, well, how's progress? Well, uh, we had another demonstration. Uh, but, you know, what did that do for Lolita? I don't know. Then in 1997, uh, a great book was written, Spectacular Nature, that uh, it was a, a UCLA sociologist who dissected SeaWorld really nicely on a table, just splayed them out and showed their entire marketing uh, strategy, basically, and went into detail about how they have defined the experience of going to SeaWorld. You're not seeing you know, animals that are hurting in any way or any kind of uh, you know, discomfort. They're happy there. And uh, not only that, but they, again, described what the animals were. They were the ultimate voice that told the public what is a killer whale, according to their marketing strategies, which changed every year. So it's a fascinating book. And also about that time, a book came out, I mean, a, a DVD came out, Lolita, Slave to Entertainment, which is great. It uh, is still making waves around the world. So then in September 98, Keiko goes to Iceland and loves it. He just he, he swam around, he dove deeper, he built up his metabolic strength and just he, he thrived in his native waters. And then he took his first ocean walk and he met some friendly whales, but he didn't bond with them, he didn't stick with them at all. And then he went to Norway. And ABC in 2020, following the lead of the media in general, said it can't be done, it's too late, uh, he's become habituated to humans and can never go back in the ocean, and that became what everybody believed, basically. And then, in December 2003, Keiko died of pneumonia or whatever, uh, and really, that sort of ended all of that jubilation about we're going to free a whale, finally, because Although it did work in many ways, Keiko did thrive until he died. Um, but the way that it was spun, of course, by the marketing machines of the industry was that not only was it a failure, but it was a crime. It was a terrible example, the worst case of animal abuse you can imagine to put him back in the ocean. And that became the public's belief. And then, this paper came out uh, in 2001, and this was not addressing captivity at all. Of course, it was about wild whales, actually all whales, but in particular they talked about orcas, and it was based largely on the studies right here uh, of the northern and southern resident orcas and, and the others. And in that, they, the authors conclude that orcas are capable of culture, without parallel except in humans. That's a pretty bold statement, that they have culture that is like ours. Um, and I could elaborate on that, and that's what I really love to talk about, so I could do that any time. But uh, that basically, that set a new bar, and that was not intended to address captivity issues, but of course, a lot of people read that, and that has, over the last 10 or 11 years, has filtered into the consciousness of a lot of people, which makes it even more atrocious that they are captured and taken away from their cultures and their families and put into tanks to do tricks. And then in 2007, this book came out, Dolphins Are Persons. This whole book, and uh, he's still on a campaign to, to develop this idea, and it's sort of growing, he's sort of uh, formulated 
the, the thinking, the philosophical and moral thinking behind the idea that dolphins, including, of course, orcas, uh, should be considered persons, not just wildlife, not just animals, but each one should be considered a person. And then another SeaWorld owner. This time it was InBev Beer Company. Stella Artois Beer from Belgium bought Budweiser and all of their parks, including SeaWorld. So they owned them all, but they didn't want the parks, they just wanted the beer. Uh, and I just had to throw this in uh, because it's beautiful. I don't know if it really had much effect beyond a very small social network following, but it's a beautiful little, uh, I think it's about 12 minute uh, DVD of, uh, it's animated, that goes into Lolita's inner life, her memories, her, her dreams, her wishes, her traumas. Uh, it's just very beautifully done. It's, uh, it's not narrated, it's just depicted with music. It's just beautiful. And we got the occasional media, uh, celebrities for Lolita and the News Times. And the media seems to mostly want to do the stories, but they have to have a story. They can't just make a statement. There has to be an event. There has to be something that they can, can hook onto and, and tell. And in that story, uh, they're, they're generally very, very good about, uh, except for talking about cake a lot, but uh, you know, I'm sort of helping with the idea that even captives should go home sometime. And then in 2007, Shelby Broy, who is out there somewhere, revived the Lolita campaign, did demos once a month and did all kinds of great stuff and really brought it back to life um, and has since moved to Olympia to pursue her studies on orchids. So the current SeaWorld owner is the Blackstone Investment Group, and this is the CEO. So just for a sort of exercise in empathy, imagine he's here today watching the rest of this show as you see what happens next to his brand new company that he just bought at the end of 2009, finalized it in November. And in 2009 also, The Cove came out, which has a big message about captivity, as many of you I'm sure know. And then in December 2009, in Laurel Parque, which is in Spain and the Canary Islands, owned by Spain, uh, a marine circus there, uh, one of the young males killed a trainer, Alexis Martinez. He's there with Don Brancho, uh, who was sent there to train the trainers, being a senior trainer at SeaWorld. And then, exactly two months later, Tillicum killed Don Brancho. This time, everybody heard about it. This made waves. This was the event that brought out the media that had been dormant for many, many years. You know, the people who think about it, and the writers, a lot of the media, they, they probably got it. It, it. it looked like it when that happened that Suddenly, they were telling the story, basically saying, should they be in captivity at all in the first place? That was pretty much the bottom line of the coverage of Don Brancho's death. And where it says uh, the camera rolls seconds before the attack, actually it was about a second after. He already has her by the arm. If you look at the footage, uh, it's pretty hard to watch, but she's being dragged in. And then the tourists who took these didn't know that that was happening and panned away. Uh, so it doesn't show the, the splash into the water. But what that did was it energized a lot of people. Uh, much to my amazement, I got a call from CNN the day that Don Brancho was killed. So I said what I knew, which wasn't much, and I referred them to Jeff Ventry, who I had met because he came out to visit the whales and get uh, familiar with the research out here. Um, and uh, I didn't know what he would do. He's never been anti, hadn't at that point ever been anti-captivity, but I knew he'd be honest and he wouldn't just give the SeaWorld spin and he would have some interesting information about the inside of SeaWorld. Well, 
And then the next day, actually, we took off to Baja, California, and went completely out of touch with the world for a week. And when we got back, we found out that Jeff had not only gone on CNN and CBS and all kinds of other media, but he had recruited several other ex-trainers uh, to also back him up and do media. And they did. And then in April 2010, uh, the first, uh, well, the first time ever that Congress addressed the issue of do these brain parts actually educate anybody? Are they of any real value to people? Uh, and, you know, of course, both sides were presented, but it was the first time that there was any kind of congressional record for any discussion about it. So that was great, and it certainly got in the headlines, and right there in Orlando, uh, Congress schedules hearing on marine mammals in captivity. And about that time, The Whale came out, which was a remake of Luna, which is really all about Luna, that adorable, wonderful little personality, um, but has some overtones about captivity, and the producers that go around with the movie and introduce it have a lot to say about captivity, so that sort of helps move the bar a little bit. And then June 10, 2010, a whale dies at SeaWorld, Taima, uh, in, in birth, uh, in, during a stillbirth, the mom and calf died. And then a little later, June 23, 2010, Morgan, a little whale, is found in the Netherlands and is rescued legitimately and brought to a park, Dolphinarium, in uh, in the Netherlands, and the deal was, and the law is, that uh, Morgan should have been rehabilitated to be released, but of course, once they got her, they said, oh, you can't release, release her now, it's too late, she's, uh, you know, been habituated, um, we can't find her family, sorry, um, so, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that story to tell you what happened in just a minute. At about the same time, uh, this blog, and this is kind of an example of the kind of blogs, but this was where those ex-trainers and some others uh, sort of put their voice out there. Again, no match for the marketing machines of the industry, but for a whole lot of media people, writers and interested people and scientists, uh, this, this was a place to find the real scoop on orchid captivity. And then Tim Zimmerman wrote the feature-length article that was really the history of captivity around the Tilikin Hillstone brand show in Orlando incident. Um, and that was the first time that that had really been done. I mean, he was extensive with his interviews and his background. And then the boom is lowered. August 2010, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, cites SeaWorld for willful neglect for allowing a trainer to get that close to Tilikum, allowing any trainers to get close to any whale. Uh, and SeaWorld, of course, couldn't stand for that. It was only a $75,000 fine, but it would have stuck, and it would have meant they could no longer put any trainers in the water with whales again. Um, so they had to fight it, and that created a hearing uh, which went on October and November of last year that revealed a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of cover-ups, a whole lot of more incidents of aggression and, and injury <coughs> to trainers that was not in the SeaWorld logs. It had to be dredged up, and some of these ex-trainers had a lot to do with dredging up a lot of that information that uh, they gave to OSHA for their case. And that is still to be resolved. That's in the hands of a judge right now. It could be any time from now till late this year. We may get a, a judgment on whether that citation will stand. Uh, but it's a very strong case. Uh, and see what will look really bad in the media. Um, about this time, these ex-trainers put together this, Orca Tracker, as another sort of a depot of information, a source to find it. You can, you can find it yourself. And it just has a lot of videos and interviews and papers and all kinds of information on captivity. So sort of put that in one place. These 
these people are energized. They're really working, even though they're ex-trainers, they're working to end the whole practice of captivity. And then another whale dies at SeaWorld, a 12-year-old male sumar. And then another whale dies at SeaWorld, three in one year, actually four if you count the, the calf being born when Taima died. Uh, all of this feeds into the public's perception and, and is right in uh, following what the trainers were saying, what a lot of us have been saying for many, many years, that captivity kills orcas. So then in December 2010, the Dolphinarium in the Netherlands says, uh, well, we can never find uh, Morgan's family, so she's going to captivity. They didn't say where at that point, but we all sort of deduced that it was going to be at Laurel Park um, in Spain. So the Free Morgan Project got underway. Ingrid Visser kind of led the way, and she is another, you know, data-driven, objective, empirical research scientist, field scientist in New Zealand until then. At that point, she, she everything added up. And she began to realize, you just can't put up with this anymore. And she organized the scientific community to come around and do something for Morgan, to try to, to convince the courts that Morgan could be returned to a sea pen off Norway, near where she her family comes from. They were matched by vocalizations. We knew where she came from. Um, and that it could be done. And such luminaries as John Ford, Lance Barrett Leonard, and a whole roster of a couple of dozen very esteemed scientists wrote letters attesting to the fact that she could be released back into the ocean. Uh, and yet, the judge decided that it can't be done. And Morgan was sent. Well, I'll get to that. But anyway. Uh, before and actually playing into that, attempting to sort of add support for Morgan's return and not being kept in captivity, um, those ex-trainers, two of them, Jeff Ventry and John Jett, wrote this paper listing all of these medical problems, most of which we had never heard about before. You know, we speak in generalities and moralities, you know, that you shouldn't do, you shouldn't have workers in captivity. But what they did was they looked at the facts. They looked at the, the, the damage, the infections, the ulcers, the tooth problems, the skin problems, all kinds of, of uh, you know, documented facts that they could do. One being a biology professor, the other being a medical doctor. Uh, they were able to write this paper that was very astute. It's not published yet. It's, they're working on a version to submit to a journal to get published. But, they put it out in time for, to try to help Morgan. And this is another blog that was written, one of our sort of co-conspirators, uh, just to try to, to amplify the voice to uh, get those whales out of those tanks. And then a movie, which is out now, just came out uh, a year ago or so, uh, Keiko the Untold Story, to clear up these misconceptions about Keiko about how actually how successful his release was in terms of him uh, climatizing back to his native habitat. He did great, uh, but you know it's a little independent movie trying to make its way in um, in the distribution circuits, and it's pretty hard to do. So you kind of have to find it. You know, it, it, you won't find it on a billboard anywhere. Uh, spring of 2011, this came out, this uh, issue of American Cetacean Society. I strongly recommend it to everybody. What this is, is the field studies that verified that 2001 paper, Culture in Whales and Dolphins. These were the studies, this is 10 years later, uh, around the world. Antarctica, New Zealand, Argentina, you know, Norway, North Pacific, North East Pacific, all over the world finding these cultures, these communities of orcas. Each one is completely distinct and is based on the idea that we have a bond with orcas like with no other animal. And really the, the conclusion, the take home message, if there's any message to take home from this, I hope it's this, that orcas are 
members of nomadic foraging tribes, not like wildlife in general, like we learned in our textbooks. Each one is bonded by cultural traditions that govern every aspect of their lives, passed down through thousands of generations, intact, <coughs> cohesive and intact over thousands of generations. Their vocalizations, the sounds they make, the diet, their movements, their social discourse, their organization patterns, everything is passed down by tradition, not, not determined by instincts, stimulus response, uh, conditioning, or anything else. Uh, July 2011, Univision, which is far bigger than any English-speaking network, uh, does a three-part series called Slave Entertainment, all about captivity and orchids. And that's a huge part of the Sequarium's uh, clientele and SeaWorld. The whole Hispanic community worldwide, North and South America, learned about orcas in captivity from this. This was sort of an outgrowth of this uh, group of conspirators that I was talking about. And then this, a remake of A Fall from Freedom, which describes the captures and all the terrible things that happened. Uh, that is available now, too. And then Tim Zimmerman wrote another story in Outside Magazine. This it took a year and a half to get the information about Quito that killed the trainer. Uh, in, in December 24th, 2009, two months before Don Brancho was killed, and revealed the, the atrocities that go on at that particular place. <coughs> Candace Whiting, who is a volunteer at the Center for Whale Research and has a long history with uh, actually working at marine parks, doing scientific studies, uh, now has a blog in the Seattle PI that I recommend to anyone. <coughs> Naomi Rose just finished her second white paper, uh, kind of like the uh, stress paper that Jeff Gentry and John Jett wrote. Uh, this one uh, goes through all the evidence why captivity kills organs. And then the OSHA hearings began, October, November, and our ex-trainers and David Kirby, who is a writer, he's written uh, several big books, investigative reporting on factory farming and autism, and now he, for the last year and a half, has been working on a book called Death at Sea World, and he is going to just open it wide open, uh, and that'll be out in June or July of this year. I strongly recommend it. It'll talk about everything I've been talking about, but in great depth lots of interviews and lots of uh, illustrious detail. Okay, five minutes, I gotta hurry. Uh, PETA has just sued SeaWorld on behalf of five captive whales. Um, that's unheard of. Uh, and I am one of the plaintiffs, or best friends, next friends, I think is the term. Uh, and then another sharp-eyed attorney in D.C. caught this in the language of the ESA listing of the Southern residents, which is that all captives are exempted, so Lolita doesn't count. Even though, I'd say, you know, by the language of the ESA, you can't do that. You can't keep her. You can't capture her and keep her like that. So they're arguing and suing National Marine Fisheries Service to have her included under the ESA listing. And then uh, both PETA and, you know, you can question a lot of the stunts they pull, but they've got a pretty good legal team and uh, they're working with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, which is pretty interesting to have these two giants in the sort of the animal welfare, animal rights uh, field uh, their legal teams working together, and so they are suing NIMS uh, under the ESA. They're the ones pulling this off. And uh, you can see that uh, it is on behalf of Shelby Proy, Karen Monroe, and Patricia Sykes, and PETA and ALDF, you know, which is really quite the, the uh, consortium. Um, and of course, the only captive that remains that this is all about is Lolita. 
And Shelby Coy, who is out there somewhere, was a bit overjoyed to see that this story made uh, front page news in the Seattle Times with a great big picture, as you can see there. Isn't Facebook wonderful? <laughs> so this is just to let you know that PETA is really all in, and not the only one. Uh, HSUS, ALDF, uh, there's some really big organizations. It's like the cavalry is here. They're coming over the hill. You know, we're getting some help, finally, to do something about captivity. And uh, here, Morgan did lose her fight for freedom, was sent to Laurel Park, uh, and at last report, was not getting along with the other workers there, uh, being harassed. Uh, we'll see how that turns out. but. Uh, the courts and the government just completely ignored the science and listened only to the industries. What happened? And Tilikum, at last report, uh, of course, you know, SeaWorld says nothing but uh, is not doing well, has been ill, and uh, but it's all kind of rumors because it's a fortress and they don't let a lot of information out. So we don't know for sure, but uh, there's sort of a, a watch on to see how Telecom does. So, how is all this affecting actual revenues at the gate? Theme park attendance in 2010. Uh, SeaWorld Orlando down 12.1%. In San Diego down 9.5%. Um, and the year before, in 2009, Orlando down 6.8%. San Diego down 12%. So that's two years of really steep declines. They're saying that 2011 turned around, but I've seen no numbers yet, so that remains to be seen. Uh, and of course, they're planning to make up for that with new exhibits, but they're not, uh, well, they're, they're enhancing, they're beefing up their tanks, putting in more false bottoms and stuff, but their new direction is in penguins and turtles and water slides. Uh, so, um, maybe they're sort of getting out of the Shamu business. And here is a, a symposium coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks in Vancouver at AAAS, American Society for the Advan American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, on uh, rights for cetaceans, basically granting them the rights of persons. And Kerry Kosky from the Whale Museum will be moderating that discussion. So. That'll be interesting. I hope to get out there. And this is a new website just started up again as a kind of a repository for all things uh, to do with the captivity issue. Okay, I've got to pretty well get out of here. Um, but here is another op-ed. Uh, this is uh, this website, Sea World's Worst Nightmare. And this is the book that will be out in uh, June or July of this year. I strongly recommend it. And also there is a writer in the audience who is working on uh, a book to depict the capture era here, the 10 years of capture. So the attitudes, the actions, the facts, all about it. So uh, Sandra Pollard will have that book out uh, in the near future. No publishing date is set just yet. So check out Facebook for our uh, updates and uh, Let's see, if I got even one minute for questions, I could take like one or two questions. Uh, three ones. Yes. Um, how old is Tillicum now? But wasn't Tillicum also involved in another, with that guy who um, was before? Right. How old is Tillicum? And yeah, and wasn't he involved in another? Yes, he was. Uh, uh, I don't recall exactly. 23, 24. Um, he's, he's certainly not, I mean, you know, he's adult, but he's not even, you know, to the average age. Uh, of an orchid. I think he's a little older than that. I'd have to look that up, sorry. Uh, but yeah, somebody stayed the night, didn't leave, and after hours, well, they found him in the morning, draped over till he comes back, pretty well mangled. Um, I'll take more questions at the beginning of the break, but are there any more right now? One. Yes, back there. Uh, Luke Rendell, R E N D E L L, and Hal Whitehead.
White's head. Strongly recommended. Yes, there. Do the captors or owners of the leader ever engage in dialogue? Ah, that's a good question. Do they engage in dialogue? No. <laughs> they just issue standard, you know, comments, statements to the media saying basically that, uh, you know, our parks entertain and educate millions of people. It, they, don't, they don't answer what we're talking about at all. So Susan has an announcement, and then we have a very special occasion for you. Um,